Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's my first uh, London conference, uh, London Coin Conference, so I am very excited to show you a bit about what we've been doing the last years. Um, so basically, uh, in our lab, we're interested in modifications in general, and this has been a long-standing story for many years, so I would just want to go a bit about why we're interested in it as well, and not just about how we can detect it. Um, so when I would like to start just like with this very first image in which we show the central dogma, right? So the one that we were taught in school, in which is, is a very simple and linear process, where DNA goes to, pro to RNA and to protein. However, we now know that actually this is a much more complex uh, pathway in which it's not only um, that some of these steps are reversible, but actually that each of these steps is finely tuned by multiple layers. So whereas the epigenome and the transcription has been more characterized in different years, actually the epitranscriptome, that is RNA modifications and translation, is much less characterized so far. And here I, um, you can see a plot of actually how many studies were published uh, of transcriptomes and translatomes. So basically our knowledge on the translatome is much smaller. Please note that the axis is in log fold. Um, so it's much smaller due to the lack of technologies to actually map them. So I think that this is a key point to understand. It's not that it's less important, but actually that we lack technologies to actually map them in a genome-wide technique. So this is just an example to illustrate how actually RNA and protein are not equivalent. So actually you can see that there's a rather poor correlation between RNA and, and protein levels, and this is in mice, uh, human tissues, in mice tissues. So why do we have such a massive difference in between RNA and protein levels? Well, one could think about many different uh, regulatory layers, and uh, you can think about the translation efficiency, there's codon usage, uh, there's also microRNAs which regulate all this. Uh, however, one of the layers that um, I'm mainly interested in and actually also contributes to this is uh, RNA modifications, which is what I will basically talk about. So what are RNA modifications? So they're just basically like chemical modifications, generally in the base position. Uh, there's uh, over 117 known so far. And historically, they had been thought as just like, you know, like little features that m basically tune the structure of the tRNA and ribosomal RNA. However, um, uh, some years ago, we already kind of uh, work, were working on this, and actually we were seeing that this is not true even for tRNAs, where actually we were seeing that they are uh, actually um, entities capable of regulating translation accuracy and translation efficiency. Um, so basically inspired by this, um, I kept working on this field because I thought that this would be a, a major uh, changing uh, game of, of how we see what RNA modifications do and are. So pretty much in the same time, uh, there was this study published, which I think was pretty much uh, a major point to breaking the epitranscriptomic field. So basically, this was the first study that showed that M6A modifications, which were known since the 70s to be in mRNAs, but they just were like, oh, these weirdo ones that are just there, nobody cares about, they're low abundant, whatever. So even though they were known since the 70s, I think that the, the, change, the change point was this one, where actually this paper showed that they can be reversed. So why would you reverse something that's just structural? Well, perhaps because if it's not structural, it's perhaps it has function, and there you, you, you have to regulate its function by putting it on and off. So this kind of mindset, with a new mindset, then actually people said, oh, we actually need to get a method to measure them genome-wide. So basically in 2012, shortly after this paper came up, the first method to map M6A genome-wide was published, basically thanks to coupling an antibody to next generation sequencing. And here I'm just showing like how the ability of having a technology to map modifications completely boosted the field of publication, because once you are able to measure it, now you can start asking the questions you're interested about. So um, just af after the method was published, you can start seeing how many functions were started to be uh, observed for M6A in this specific case. So you could find uh, uh, cell differentiation, stress responses, sex determination. So there were a massive widespread functions uh, that were found in the, in, for M6A modifications. However, um, what about the rest, right? Um, so actually, this was a study that a PhD student did in the lab recently just to do a survey of literature where I actually asked him, okay, how many of the different RNA modifications can we actually associate to human diseases just from published literature? So here, like, he colored in red those that actually he found uh, publications to be disease 
associated. And here in, in green, he just showed those for which we have technologies to map them, right? And they're all, always in general uh, using um, antibodies and in some cases due to chemical treatment. Because in, in general, current technologies so far before uh, nanopore pretty much relied on next generation sequencing. And, and for either of these things, you need either anti an antibody or a selective chemical, which you then, this, this uh, chemical or the antibody will selectively bind uh, or um, react with the modification. And then you can couple this with different strategies with next generation sequencing and finally identify where the modification is. However, even for those cases for which modification is, this has some big problems. So first of all, it needs a lot of customized protocol and optimization for each modification. Um, there's no stoichiometry information that you can get from it. Um, often there is no modification antibody or chemical. So basically, in, in conclusion, this leaves the majority of modifications that you cannot map. Uh, so we cannot know what they do, really. So, Basically, in my opinion, novel methods to map modifications were greatly needed uh, already since for many years. And uh, actually, I was uh, very happy when in my postdoc, I moved uh, to the Garmin Institute and I met my colleague Martin. So he actually showed me this device and I was like, what is this? <laughs> and, uh, and basically, it pretty much was solving all the problems that we were facing. So, so basically, we engaged into the project of uh, trying to see if we could get um, RNA modifications to be detected with nanopore. Um, and uh, we actually were super excited when finally they released the first RNA sequencing kit. And our first run was a disaster. <laughs> um, but then we kind of got better into it. And uh, we can get like very nice full length reads and, and so on, right? So OK, now we're able to get uh, direct RNA sequencing working. But can we actually measure modifications with it, right? So this um, is a, a different problem, right? So everyone knows that theoretically it's possible to detect them, right? So everyone like it, it's, supposed the, it's supposedly causing a change in the current intensity. Um, However, uh, there's more things that can cause this change in the current intensity, and it's not that straightforward always to actually associate every single change to the current intensity to the presence of a modification. So some of the problems actually could be due to the need to re-squiggle. That is not that easy in some cases, but then basically I think that a major caveat is that you need a training set actually to be able to make a proper base color algorithm to detect modifications. So that's what we try to do. So um, basically, we kind of came up with this idea, uh, which is to design uh, sequences which would cover for all possible five MERS, which would occur in at least uh, in a median of 10 different times. So we call these the curl cakes because that's the software that we actually use to design them. Uh, basically, it designs uh, using the bridging graphs uh, all possible five MERS and uh, minimizing the RNA structure, which you actually don't want very much in the, for direct RNA sequencing, right? So um, uh, the preliminary data here was released in BioArchive recently, so we would love to hear your feedback. Um, and basically, the idea is to sequence both unmodified and modified uh, sequences uh, through the nanopore, and basically to collect a set of features, which using machine learning, we would ideally aim to be able to classify either into modified or non-modified sequences. And we pretty much benchmark this with the uh, M6A to start with. Sorry, apologies here, I forgot to put the first lane is uh, M6A, and the second one is actually unmodified. So just from after producing the reads, when we map them to our curl cake sequences, you kind of can see already that, OK, there's some errors in, in the unmodified. But basically, the M6A modified has a massive amount of errors just by looking into the, into the, um, in, into the, the, the region of the IGV snapshot. And basically, this said, like, OK, maybe we just don't have to focus only on uh, looking into current intensity changes as so far some other approaches have been doing. But what if we actually also use these base calling errors as a strategy to identify RNA modifications as reads? So we actually started to looking at some metrics, and we saw that there's base quality, which was decreasing, and there was an increased number of mismatches, as can be seen from the IGV snapshot. But also, like there were um, deletions as well as uh, some insertions, but the insertions were very unfrequent. Uh, but in addition to the current intensity, which was what, what we were expecting, right? So 
we said, okay, we call you all these features. This is actually a replicable finding. If we would do this in a different set, were we just unlucky and we had a terrible run, or is this actually something that we can work with? So how replicable are these features? So what you can see here is that if you look at, for example, base quality and mismatch frequency, if you look at two different independent replicates in two different flow cells, uh, the features for base quality are highly reproducible in unmodified A's as well as in modified A's. However, when you compare both of them is when you see a massive difference, and that's what we're trying to explore. Load, right? So we decided to focus on RRACH sites because those are the ones that are known to contain M6A in, bio in biologically relevant uh, contexts. So basically we compared M6A motifs versus control motifs, which would be the same motif, but then in the middle position, not having an A. And what we kind of see is just by doing PCA analysis that actually the two motifs kind of separate pretty well in the M6A motif, but not in the control motif, which does not contain the modification. And then using all these features, we actually trained uh, some machine learning algorithms, uh, first using some uh, single features and seeing which feature performed better. And finally, we also did some combination of features where basically we would do combinations of quality, mismatch, current, and, um, and deletion frequency, which was finally the best performing one. And we also tried other combinations, which I'd be happy to discuss about, um, but for uh, time reasons, I prefer not to focus on this right now. So overall, um, what we kind of found was that uh, the combination of raw features as well as a face call feature was, is what is producing best results. And we can kind of exemplify this just with this example, Kamer, right? So this is just taking the data and then just looking into a specific uh, Kamer and comparing. So what we can see is that in some cases, like in the case of, uh, like of GTACA, yeah, there's a shift in current intensity, but it's not that massive. And in other cases, it's actually nicer, like in the case of GGACC. But then um, if you actually combine that with specific features, you can actually enhance the difference that you're seeing in, in between the modified and unmodified data sets. So basically, this is just to illustrate why the combination of both things, we think that is the way to go to actually build uh, base calling algorithms. So then we aim to actually validate this with in vivo because of course, like this in vitro, blah, blah, of course, like we want to see if this works in vivo, right, actually. Uh, and I completely agree. Um, I must say that it's much more challenging, first of all, because you don't know exactly uh, what you expect. Because even if you have known sites, you don't have know in which reads of those known sites your modification will be found. So assessing accuracy becomes a bit more tricky. Um, but in any case, we actually used a uh, yeast uh, wild type and IME4 knockout uh, um, strains, and the IME4 actually lack M6A, so they're a good set to actually validate one against the other. And this is a collaboration with uh, Shraga Schwarz, uh, who actually sent us these uh, uh, strains. So what we see is that in the similar way to what we were observing with the curl cakes, the uh, base colic features actually are changing in, in, the, in the knockout, uh, but not in the, in the, um, sorry, in the wild type, but not in the knockout. You can see actually here, sorry, I should put the label, it's down in the bottom, so I'll just put all the replicates. <laughs> um, so you can see that in the IME4 strain, actually the, the features are not changing because they don't have the modifications, whereas in the case of the wild type, they are. And here you can just see some visual inspection of some individual sites, which are known M6A modified sites using Illumina sequencing, where basically you can see that in the wild type, you see this increased mismatch error, just looking at the mismatch error and in this point. And uh, in the IME4, for those same exact positions, you don't see those, um, those, those mismatches, right? There's there also like some errors here and there overall, because I mean, it's, we do have an issue with like the, the, the mismatch frequency in, on direct RNA is higher than in R and DNA, right? But however, like when you start having replicates, those positions which are found in the three replicates and not found in the, in the knockouts actually can be kind of a good consistent way to identify modifications. So we now decided, so inspired by these results, we now decided to pursue further modifications, right? So um, basically, this is what we are serving with uh, M6A. Does this happen with other modifications as well, right? So then we started building M other data cells like M5C, 5HNC. These two are actually, I think, quite interesting because Illumina methods cannot distinguish between the two. So maybe Nanopore can just get in there and actually be able to distinguish the two of them. And as well as pseudouridine. We can see that pseudouridine causes massive <laughs> problems in terms of uh, error rates um, uh, for whatever reason we, st we still don't understand. Um, but basically we want to use this strategy to benchmark different uh, modifications and be able to perhaps uh, together with other people in the, 
in the community, you know, train together and get a better base call so we can start answering the questions which we care about, right? So what, something that I always get as well, and I would like to maybe finish with this part, um, uh, when I work with direct RNA and I tell people, oh, we can now sequence RNA directly without no reverse transcription, it's like, oh, and, uh, but well, like, can, how can you decrease the cost? Because you actually don't get that much coverage, right? And then I also get a second question a lot is like, oh, like when I tell them, yeah, you need 500 nanograms of poly A plus RNA, and they go, oh, like <laughs> so, so basically, like, if we want to apply this uh, to biological systems, maybe we should think about how can we decrease the input somehow. And in the lab, we've been working on how to optimize uh, some library preparations to get better yields. Um, but I would just like to briefly mention this strategy, which I think can be an alternate strategy, which is to do barcoding on direct RNA, right? So if you actually um, don't care so much about the yield, but you actually can want to reduce cost, for example, uh, like for us with the curl cakes, for example, uh, you can actually do some barcoding. So this is in collaboration with M Martin's lab as well. Um, and the idea is that instead of just like, like for the cDNA or for other kits, we do have barcoding uh, strategies available. Uh, however, for the direct RNA, we currently don't. And for us, like we don't have an unlimited budget, so we actually were very keen in reducing the cost uh, for our lab. So we decided to really pursue this uh, even for, for, for ourselves, right? So basically, um, the idea is that you can use the, the, you can incorporate your adapter in ONT's adapter itself. So basically, you can put a piece of DNA sequence that instead of being the standard ONT sequence, will have a shuffled sequence. And then using some deep learning, uh, you can afterwards classify the squiggles again and get uh, and classify your reads in depending on which barcode they had. So you're not going to be base calling your barcodes. You're going to be classifying them based on their squiggles. So um, the current results that we have uh, are 98% 9, accuracy with an 80% recovery. And uh, this is a, a joint work by uh, both Martin and, and I, and actually the bioinformaticians to recognize here would be James Ben Fondi and Tonsil. And um, we'd be very keen in actually um, releasing this very soon. Um, so with this, I would just like to thank the people who actually uh, did a lot of the work. Um, so my little lab, which just started in uh, 2018, now not so little, like it kind of grew fast. Um, so especially Juan Lee and Jose Miguel and Ozan and Morgan, who did a lot of the work I, I disclosed here. Um, and also like a lot to our collaborators, especially Martin, with whom I started many of these projects and who drove me into the uh, dark side of the nanopore field. And also Chris and Straga for, for collaborating with us in these uh, projects. And uh, of course, uh, I would like to acknowledge the funding who trusted us when uh, others maybe thought that this was crazy. And um, finally, I would also like to thank my husband um, because uh, it is not that easy to be a scientist and a mom and a starting group. And I would say that this would never be possible um, without him. So I'm here thanks to him. And with this, thank you for your attention.